Amen. God's good. And uh, uh, thank you guys for just your faithfulness, your love, your obedience in the kingdom. Um, God's good. Amen. So today I want to speak about, uh, you know, and I, sometimes when we're getting ready to start a new topic for Global Harvest School of Supernatural Ministry on Sunday morning, I do a little bit of an intro. Uh, for some of you, this is stuff that you know. It's a core value in your life. Uh, but for others, it's just what God is doing at this moment in a moment of restoration. So I'm talking about today the new wineskin of the apostolic church. Amen. And uh, it's not really a new wineskin, amen. It's something that God is restoring to the church at this moment. He's been doing it for a while, amen. And, uh, you know, our, our topic, as Jamie mentioned, is we have a school of FIFO ministry beginning in GHSSM tomorrow night. And I want us to turn, when we talk about FIFO ministry, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4, Verses 11 through 12. Amen. Let's start there. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just thankful when the Lord, uh, he, he starts restoring things that perhaps have been lost in the church. Amen. And it's not necessarily something new, but it's a moment of restoration. How many of you know we're in a, a great moment of restoration in the church? And that, that many things that uh, he, he, God's been doing, um, especially since the beginning of the 20th century, there's been a great outpouring of the Spirit. And I think in the last 120 years, um, we've been living in some of the most radical, powerful times in the history of the church. Amen. And so let's look at Ephesians 4, verse 11. It says, And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Amen. Now, if you look at this verse, um, you know, there's a shift in our perspective, and it's not so much for many of us because of the things that God's been doing, but... um, the purpose of the early church, the purpose of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers was, according to verse 12, what was that purpose? To do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Okay? Now, who's a saint in here today? Yeah. You guys should all raise your hands, right? Now, you may not feel very saintly today, right? Maybe tonight, even in the Super Bowl, you'll behave like a saint. I don't know. But, uh, you know, when, when Paul wrote a letter, when he wrote letters to the early church scattered throughout many places, he would always address it to the saints in that region. We are saints. We're holy ones. We're set apart. And the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to equip all of us for the work of ministry. Amen. And you may say today, well, you know, I'm not called to ministry. Well, according to this verse, you are. You're a saint called to do the works of ministry. Now, we're going to talk about that today. But, you know, in the early church, um, the leadership didn't really look at those in the church as just sheep to be cared for right? They viewed them as the saints called by God to minister, to bring heaven to earth, to release the glory of God wherever the Lord placed them. Amen. And and God's forming this wineskin in the church at this moment to not only to contain his glory, but to pour it out. Amen. And so let's let's look. Let's look through the filter of Acts 2. And I know the last few weeks we've looked a lot at Acts chapter 2. Um, but I want to go back there today and I want to look at it. But what happens oftentimes is when we look at Acts chapter 2, we look at it through our modern day church filter. Right? And let's talk about that. So here's what happens. You know, Holy Spirit, there's an outpouring. And... Uh, um, Peter preaches, and you know there's this there's this sound that comes out of heaven, right? There's an open heaven 
that they experience. And the sound of heaven comes to earth. Tongues of fire rest on each person. Okay, They all pray in, in, in a language that they probably didn't know. And people heard different languages as they were praying. Um, they were declaring the mighty works of God. Amen. And suddenly a city that just weeks ago had crucified Jesus, everybody began to say, what must we do to be saved? Wow. An incredible shift happens because suddenly they're living under an open heaven. And not only were they living under an open heaven, Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the same guy who just weeks before had said to a servant girl, I don't know Jesus, right, suddenly is empowered. He's empowered. He's transformed by the Spirit. And under an open heaven, he begins to declare the gospel, right? And it, people are pierced to the heart, right? And, and as they're pierced to the heart, they say, what must we do to be saved? It was an incredible moment. And suddenly, the church, which there was 120 present, okay? We know that Jesus appeared to over 500 people, but there were 120 present. It's kind of like a Sunday morning, <laughs> right? Um, but the 120, suddenly, 3, 000, about 3,000 people get saved, right? And the church suddenly grew from 120 to 3,120 approximately, right, in that day. And uh, so here's our modern, our modern framework. So suddenly we see the apostles as the pastors. And they suddenly have a congregation of 3,120. But we do know that the Scripture says that day by day people were getting saved. And the church in Jerusalem just begins to explode with what God is doing. And it already, Jerusalem had already filled the capacity because everybody had come into Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. All these people had come in from out of town. It was like a conference, right? They'd all gone to Voice of the Apostles or Open Heavens at Bethel, you know. And God moved so much that the majority of them stayed, Right, and there's this explosion of what God's happening, and uh, and so they're all hanging around, and so you know this church suddenly is there, and in our framework, here's what happens. You know, we read about the apostles' teaching and all this, and and so we think that they started to teach them things like to tithe. They started a building fund, right. They taught them how important it was to um, attend church regularly, to have good lives and happy marriages and raise their children right. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Those, those are important things, right? But that's our modern perspective, and, and we think, okay, we're just going to teach you guys to be faithful, um, work in the nursery, clean the building, be good until you die and go to heaven. Right? That's modern Christianity in America at this moment. And you know what? The apostles, they thought the, the apostles, they would continue to teach and minister, um, uh, heal the sick, cast out some devils. And everyone would think that's a healthy church. They built a building, right? Um, maybe they had two services, right? Maybe more because, you know, that's all we could get in in this building. And, you know, property was probably really expensive in Jerusalem. I don't know. But then what happened in Acts chapter 8? This kind of blows that perspective out of the water. Because what happens is suddenly, and of course, Acts chapter 8 is probably years later. You know, sometimes we read our Bible like Acts chapter 2 and then Acts chapter 3 was just hours later or days later. It was probably years later. 
And you've got thousands of people who've been sitting under the apostles' teaching. And it talks about in Acts chapter 2. You know, they were, they were breaking bread. They were fellowshipping. They were going, meeting house to house. They were meeting daily. All these things. And then suddenly a persecution breaks out in Acts chapter 8. And it says that all the believers in Jerusalem left and got scattered because of the persecution, except for the apostles who stayed there. Okay, Now, if that happened today in many American churches, it would be devastating. right? What would happen if... The church got scattered, and and um, you know we just been taught to be good church members. It would be a disaster. The, without the leadership of the church, most people would be scattered. They wouldn't know what to do. Um, they'd fall away. Everything would fracture, right? But let's turn to Acts chapter eight. Let's see what happened in Acts eight. And we know that everybody scatters because Saul's putting everybody to death, right? You would probably scatter too. I mean, we probably would. But it says in verse 4 there of chapter 8, Therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Right? All these people who had been persecuted, they're going into all kinds of different areas and they're preaching and declaring and demonstrating the gospel without skipping a beat. Because for years, the apostles had been duplicating what was in them. Right? Isn't that what Jesus said they were supposed to do in Acts 28? He said, you, you go and disciple nations and teach them everything that I taught you to do. Right? We're supposed to be doing the same things that the original 12 apostles of the Lamb did. Amen. And we're supposed to, everything Jesus taught his disciples, everything that he taught those disciples and apostles, their commission was, boys, and a few women too, go and reproduce yourselves. Right? Go and fill Jerusalem with what I've taught you, and then go and fill the earth, fill the nations, take this glory, take this that I've given you. I've given you the kingdom, and you go, and you take it, and you take it to the nations, right? That's what Jesus commissioned them to do, and so that's what they did, right? And even even beyond that, right? Look at at Acts 8, verse 7. So Philip goes down to Samaria. Okay? And it's really interesting because Samaria, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't really like each other. Right? But Philip went down, and Philip wasn't even one of the original 12 apostles. Right? Here's a guy who had been uh, waiting tables. He'd been a deacon, and he goes... But you know what? He'd been taught... He'd received the teaching, the impartation, the kingdom culture, and he goes down to Samaria, which is ripe for revival and awakening. Why is it ripe for revival and awakening? Because didn't Jesus minister to a Samaritan woman at the well who became the first evangelist? He said, hey, and she went to all the men in the city. Why did she go to the men? Interesting, right? And told them what Jesus had done for her, right? So there was something of the gospel that had been sown in Samaria. So here, years later, Philip comes into this this place where it was kind of a little bit off limits to the Jews, but was ready and ripe, and a revival ignites in Samaria. Amen. And it says that, um, that he's preaching and proclaiming Christ to them. And look at verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. Right. 
he wasn't one of the original 12. How's he doing miracles? Well, he'd been taught by the 12 in an apostolic church, in an apostolic culture, that that's what the kingdom looked like, right? That not only are you proclaiming the gospel, but you're demonstrating it. Amen. And so he's demonstrating, and it says in, in, um, in verse 7, For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was much rejoicing in that city. Right? And then it goes on to the account, you can read it, about Simon the sorcerer, Right, who interestingly enough, whenever there's a move of God, there are people who try to rise up with a mixture. Right? And I, I didn't even realize this till I was reading this week um, some stuff that many poli- people believe that Simon the sorcerer started the doctrine, the false doctrine of Gnosticism which became a huge, huge stumbling block to the church. And you can study all that out. That's not my, my sermon today. Here's something that you can chase after, right? Uh, uh, but this happens, and there's this move of God. Philip ignites a revival in Samaria. Now, it's not just Philip, right? Let's, ch- let's f- skip over to Acts chapter 9. And so you've got people, and a lot happens between this, you know, in between Acts 8 and Acts 9. Um, Saul gets saved and becomes Paul. Um, but verse 31 of Acts chapter 9, it's really interesting because it says, The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Now, wait a minute. The church had just been only in Jerusalem, right? It was good in Jerusalem. You know, we joke about it. It was like probably Reading is right now, right? Or Tulsa in the 1980s and 1990s, right? Everybody wanted to hang out there because God was just doing incredible stuff, right? But everybody gets scattered, and it says, The church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. So all these people that had got scattered, you know what they did? They went and they preached the gospel and they planted churches wherever they went. All throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, the church started exploding because these people, these men and women, had a culture of kingdom revival, awakening that was part of their training and their equipping. And they understood, we're receiving what the apostles were given by Jesus. We've received it, and we're taking it wherever we go, and we're establishing the kingdom wherever we go. We're establishing and planning the gospel, and we're raising up a kingdom culture, a kingdom dynamic. We're driving the gospel into the ground. And we're saying, God, you inhabit this region. You live in this place, and we're going to make disciples just like Jesus did, just like the early church did in us. Amen. And it says that those churches begin to grow like crazy. Amen. Now, again, these guys are a product of what the apostles did. Right now, what's 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 a pastor's job? We'll just make it easy. If we'll just say pastor in the traditional sense, okay? Are the pastors the only ones that are supposed to minister in the church? When you watch the Super Bowl tonight, who's going to watch the Super Bowl? Right? Some are big football fans, and some just want to watch J Lo and Shakira, Shakira. <laughs> right? In the in the halftime show. If hopefully there will be no wardrobe malfunctions, right? Okay, ladies, just what? <laughs> right. <laughs> Some people just watch for the commercials, which really aren't that good anymore, right? And so, uh, but tonight, do you think any of the coaches will make a touchdown? Alan, when you coached, did you ever make a touchdown? 
in every step with them, right? Living through them, but you know what? His, his, <laughs> hey, Alan, you, you guys don't know, Alan used to be a football star, right? He's done that. He's been there, done that, right? Sold the t-shirt, right? Um, outgrew it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a half shirt now, right? <laughs> Isn't that terrible when that happens, right? <laughs> but tonight, what, what's happened is the coaches have equipped the players to do the stuff. And you're not going to see any of the coaches out on the field, right? Because with the exception of Allen... Most coaches get a bit heavier. Do you notice that? Right? Right? Now, don't say that, correlate that to any pastors. Right? Because I'm, I'm fighting it every step of the way. Right? And weighty, the kabod glory, weighty glory of God. We're just soaking it up. Right? <laughs> she said, that's ice cream. Right? <laughs> That bluebell is good, right? But, um, you know, what leaders do is they're, they train the saints to make the touchdown, right? A leader's success, again, we look at th- things through our 21st century filters, but a leader's success isn't based on drawing the biggest crowd on a Sunday morning. Now, when we have a crowd, I love it. Of course I love it. Right? We want that. Every, we want that. You know, it's a leader's success isn't even based on a leader's ability to heal the sick and cast out demons. Even though that's as important as well. I like to see the sick healed when I pray for them. I like to cast out demons, usually. Right? Yeah. Um, but... A measure of a leader's success is whether or not that they can raise up a generation of saints who can minister better than we can. Right? That's what success in ministry looks like. I, I hope, and you guys, and I'm, I'm watching some of you, some of you are more prophetic than me. Some of you have a stronger healing gift than me. Right? Jamie's probably a better preacher than I am. Do not say amen. So my mom told her before she passed away, she said, you're a better preacher than Andy, but don't tell him I said that. And she told me, right? <laughs> and, and, but you know what? That's kingdom because we're, we're pouring into a generation, right, and, and when uh, there, there's not competition in the kingdom, but we celebrate when someone surpasses us, right? That's what the kingdom looks like. Some of you, are, as you continue to grow, right, some of you will be far more gifted in deliverance and inner healing than I've ever been, right? I mean, I look at, even just in the natural, I look at some of my kids, some of the things that Olivia does. Right. Man, she did an amazing job yesterday. I will never sing like that. Right? It's amazing. When Emily speaks, you know, and when she prophesies, I'm just like, holy moly, who is this kid? Right? Mia's already far more intelligent than me. Right? <laughs> You know, and I love it. I love it when my kids excel me and they go past me. And it's the same way in the kingdom, right? I don't want to be threatened when someone can prophesy at a higher level or move in a a gifting, you know. Will's, Will's gift, his prophetic gift is crazy off the charts, right? I love that. Dusty Huck's. And Dusty's got a powerful, powerful healing gift, right? He's not in here, so I'm going to talk about him, right? 
I don't think he even realizes how strong his gift is, right? You know, the kingdom is like we're raising up a people that will surpass us. And that's not only okay, it's desired, right? That's what the kingdom looks like, right? And, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, we were, we were praying here after school one day, and I just saw um, this table. Some of you have heard me talk about it, and I saw it was the Lord's table. It was so big. Just went, I was like in the middle of it, and it went so far this way and so far this way, and it was so big. And, and I just heard the Lord say, Andy, if people realized how much room there was at my table, there wouldn't be competition in my kingdom. There's more than enough, right? Man, and we, we all, I got it. I have to continually get a revelation of that, right? Because I want, I don't want to be moving in an orphan spirit, right? I don't want to be moving in a poverty spirit where, and those things are connected together, where I'm like, you know, no, I have to fight for position and I have to be in competition with other gifts and other ministers and all that. No, there's more than enough in the kingdom of God, amen? And we all get a place at the table, right? And I saw that, and it was so life-changing to me. Now, sometimes I still have to go back there, right? When I want to be territorial, right? All right, Lord, I'm going to sit down at your table for a minute. There's more than enough, right? But that's what kingdom looks like, amen? And, And the church is His body, in the earth, right? It's all of us. Now, leaders have a, an important call, right? To equip the saints, to lead, to have authority and all those things. Authority is important. We've talked about authority before, you know. But the body of Christ, all of us are to be an ex- a visible expression of His presence, His power, and His love, Right? In the book of Acts, the apostles weren't just teaching the 3,000 to be good church members. They were teaching them to do the works that Jesus did. Amen. And, uh, you know, does that mean that you're going to stand behind a pulpit? Maybe. Maybe that's part of your call. Maybe it's not. Okay. Ministry is doing what Jesus did. And that means that if you find people that are oppressed by the enemy, you bring them into the blessings of God, right? If you find people who are lost, you bring them into salvation and everything that that means. It's so much bigger than we thought it was, right? That if if you find people that are in bondage, You bring them into deliverance. Amen. If you find people that are sick, you bring them into healing. Amen. If you find people that are in lack, you find them and you teach them how to walk in abundance. Right? You bring them into those things. That's ministry. Amen. Now, let's notice how the New Testament describes members of the early church. We already looked at Acts chapter 8, verse 4. And those that were scattered, they all went out. They all went out and about preaching the word. Okay? Now, what about another very famous passage of Scripture? Mark 16. Let's turn to Mark 16, verses 17 and 18. And these signs will accompany those who have believed. Now, does that say these signs will accompany those who are apostles or prophets or evangelists, pastors, teachers? No, it says these signs will accompany those who have believed. So what's the condition of moving in ministry? Faith. You believe, right? You believe God. And it says that... uh, 
uh, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. So today, we have poison and snakes. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> that's next Sunday, right? You visitors are good, right? Uh, no, but it, it just that just means that we won't be harmed by the power of the enemy or any circumstances in the earth that are trying to bring destruction. Do we need to know that in today? I mean, regardless of what's happening with the coronavirus, we won't be harmed, amen? There's a supernatural protection that God brings. And the cure is not drinking, drinking a bunch of coronas. <laughs> regardless of what you've heard, don't try that tonight. Some of y'all know what coronas are. You shouldn't know that. Right? <laughs> you saw the commercial, right? <laughs> just on a commercial, right? I'm just part of the culture, right? <laughs> but yeah, there's this reality that we're living and, and, and not only being affected by the power of the enemy. Now, sometimes does the power of the enemy and the circumstances of what's happening in the culture on the earth, do those things try to affect us? Yes, right? I mean, we fought some stuff last night, Right? Ugh, I hate the devil, right? But we're like, nope, nope. This power isn't going to affect us. We're pressing through it, right? Uh, we're pressing through those things. We're moving past that, amen? When sickness and disease, when those things try to come on us and try to attack us, no, God, thank you that you're greater than the power of the enemy. We move in faith. Amen. We believe what he said, and, and we, we press in to receive from him what he's pouring out. Amen. And so everybody who wants to move in this, and we've been commissioned and called to do it, they can all heal and deliver. Amen. John 14, 12. And I'm just trying to give us some, some scriptures here that, that show the reality of this. John 14, 12, Jesus speaking to his disciples. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Is that crazy? You guys are called to do great, the works that Jesus did? And greater works. Right? I remember reading Randy, uh, an article where Randy Clark was talking about going to minister for the first time. I don't know if it was the first time. With Roland and Heidi Baker in Mozambique. And, you know, Randy's known for this healing anointing that he has. And a revivalist. He's the guy that ignited the revival in Toronto in the 90s. And he goes and he was like, I was going very intimidated. He said, because... He said, I've never raised anyone from the dead, but some of those bush pastors working with Iris had seen multiple people raised from the dead. And he said, and I've met some of them who've raised more people from the dead than Jesus did. Right? Doing the greater works. I was reading this week uh, a report from a Global Awakening magazine and and, and someone asked Tom Jones, the executive director of Global Awakening, what's the greatest miracle you've ever seen? And again, he was in Mozambique with the bakers, right? It's a hot spot for the miraculous because they have no alternative. Right? And there was this baby that didn't have pupils. And everybody was praying for the baby. And they all prayed for the baby. Tom prayed for the baby. And they handed the baby off to Heidi, and Heidi began to weep and hold the baby, and she poured water on a cloth, and she just began to wipe the baby's eyes in love. And a few moments later, the baby had pupils. And, and they called the mother up just to confirm that this had really happened, and it had really happened. 
And, and the, the mother said, basically, I came for a miracle. I came for this. Now, did it take some believing and some pressing, right? Multiple people prayed. Heidi did a prophetic act. As the Spirit led her, she poured out love. And this baby got pupils, right? They're doing the things that Jesus did, right? And what's the condition? Those who believe, right? First part of us, some of us, we just have to get past the hurdle of understanding that it's not only possible, right, to get out of our Western mentality, right, and to enter into not only is it possible, I'm called to do it, right? I'm called to walk in it. I'm called to step into it, right? And, and, and that's part of the kingdom culture that God's establishing. 1 Corinthians 14.1. Let's turn here. Again, a very familiar passage of Scripture. First Corinthians 14.1. Pursue love. Hallelujah. Pursue love. Yet, desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Right? Paul said, yeah, pursue love, but you're supposed to earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you can prophesy. Amen? Hallelujah. Then let's just go ahead and read verse 31. This will blow some of our religious ideas out of the water. Verse 31, for you can all prophesy. Right? One by one, some of you that in supernatural school when we did those prophetic exercises and you're like, I can't do it. For you can all prophesy one by one. Why? So that all may learn and all may be exhorted. Right? There's even a process where in the church we're supposed to lead people in the prophetic so that everyone can learn. Right? You can all prophesy. You can all declare what God is saying, regardless of your gifting, right? We can all move in that, okay? Here's another one. Isn't this good? Right? And we, we have these religious mindsets that, you know, no, 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 no. That's just for the leadership. Hebrews 5, 12. This is a really fun one. For by this time, you ought to be teachers, Right? You, have, you ought to be teachers. You have need, again, for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Whoever wrote Hebrews, and no one's really for sure, right? Even though there are a lot of different theories, but the writer of Hebrews is like, come on, guys. Some of y'all need to start eating meat, and you've been just feasting on milk too long, and you all should be teachers at this point. Now, does that mean that we all have the ministry gift of the teacher? No, it doesn't mean that. We'll talk about that this month in Supernatural School, right? But it does mean, I mean, can you do, the evangel do evangelism and not be an evangelist? Absolutely. That's why God sends evangelists not only to win the lost, but to equip the saints to move in evangelistic anointing, right? That's why he sends teachers, right? Not only who have a gift of teaching, but have a grace to activate you to know the Word and be able to teach the Word, right? There comes a point in our Christian walk where if we grow and mature, as the Lord has called us to, we're able to teach the Word, right? Now, some may teach it at a higher level, but still, there's an element that we should all be able to do these things, whether it's praying for the sick, casting out devils, prophesying, teaching the Word. In the New Testament, all are supposed to do this. Amen? Hallelujah. Jesus equipped the saints, right? And we know that there were times in Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10 
that he would commission his apostles, but he would also commission the 70. Go out. Bring the kingdom. Heal the sick. Isn't that crazy that Jesus didn't say pray for the sick? He said, go heal the sick. Right? And he commissioned them to go heal the sick, cast out demons, declare that the kingdom had come. Amen. And then when he gets ready to ascend to the Father, he says, boys, everything I've taught you to do, right? Here, I'm giving you the kingdom. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, right? Teaching them to do everything that I've commanded you to do, right? Now, that kind of upsets the apple cart. Because suddenly, in the American church, we have to understand, I'm responsible. I'm responsible to do the stuff. And it's so fun... It's so fun watching people begin to move and stuff, right? It's so fun the first time that you pray for someone and you watch them get healed, right? It's almost funny to see sometimes who's more surprised. I like it when you pray for people and they're like, I don't believe it. Or when you pray for someone and they get healed and your response is, I don't believe it. Right? But there's there's something when you begin to move in that, right? That, That you begin to experience the power of God. You begin to experience the love of God. You begin to experience the compassion of God, right? You begin to experience those things. You know, the first time that you see something demonic, it's weird, right? And you may never see it, but when you see those things letting go of people, right? Or when you prophesy, right? And when you begin to move in those things and you begin to move in heavenly realms, it's powerful. Sometimes people don't like it, right? There's a call for us to be the apostolic church. And I know there are a lot of terms floating around about what that looks like, but that means that we just get equipped to do what Jesus has called us to do. Right? And sometimes can it be intimidating? Sure it can. Right? But it just takes a shift of our understanding to begin and move those things. And that's why the church in the book of Acts blew up. Because right? they had an understanding, we're all ministers. We're all called to move in this. We're all called to release the glory of God right? in our homes, in our businesses. That's why Christianity blew up. You read historical accounts and they're like, there's no place that Christians haven't gone. They're everywhere. They're in the marketplace, right? They're merchants. They're slaves, right? They're in the government. They're everywhere. And they're filling the earth with the glory of God and the teaching and the power and the majesty of God. Amen. And that's why Christianity spread like wildfire. Amen. So today, you're commissioned, right? And I do this often on Sunday. You're commissioned today in your classroom, whether you're a student or a teacher. Now, don't disrupt the class, right? Hannah, if you start having words of knowledge, you know... In class, I don't know how you're going to facilitate that, right? (laughs) Right? Right? You're commissioned to go and do the works of God. He's with you, 
Right? He's with you. Sometimes we're waiting for the goose bump. Right? Somebody in the cubicle next to you may not shout glory. Right? And that's when you just begin to move in what God's doing by faith, knowing He's with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, this morning we're going to have communion. Amen. We always do this as much as possible on the first Sunday of the month. Hallelujah. I just want to read out of 1 Corinthians 11. Amen. And, and know that as we're taking communion, that it's a table of grace. Amen. If you have need, I want you to approach the Lord's table as a communion table of grace. Right? We've seen people get healed just through communion. Right? We, I believe that God not only wants to heal physically, um, I think sometimes when we're celebrating what Jesus has done, that sometimes we might get delivered from something. Right? If you have an area in your life where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't take communion because I might drop dead. Right? Anybody raised like that? Yeah, I was. If you've got sin, don't take communion. Right? We all have to sit down. Right? But come to the communion table like, God, I come because of the blood and body of Jesus. I come to receive what you've done. I appropriate grace that empowers. I appropriate the healing of Jesus. I appropriate the blood of Jesus. Lord, thank you that you've saved me and that you are saving me. Lord, deliver me, heal me, set me free as I celebrate what you've done. Amen. So let me read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord Jesus that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, Lord, today, I thank you for your body, for your blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your atonement. Father, that salvation, healing, deliverance come in and through the atonement. And so, Lord, we celebrate your life, your death, your resurrection today. Lord, thank you that you're seated, that just as you went into death and you were resurrected, Lord, I thank you that we were also buried with you. We were also resurrected with you. And, Lord, we're seated with you in heavenly places. God, thank you for that. Thank you that you didn't leave us where we were, but Lord, Lord, you drew us out, you glorified us, you set us free. And Lord, we just appropriate salvation today. We appropriate healing today as we approach your table. Thank you, Lord. We bless the elements of the communion table today in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we take communion here, uh, Sean will put on some music. Just come. You can come from either side. Take the elements of communion, uh, go back to your seat um, as, as you worship, and, and just take that uh, at your own pace. Amen. So, Sean, if you'll put that on, let's do that now. Jesus, we're filled with wonder. We're filled with wonder at what you've done, and we just want to behold you. In all your glory. Thank you, Lord, for the tangible grace that is present today. To move, to minister, to heal, to strengthen, to encourage, to refresh. Thank you for your marvelous majesty today. We honor, we love you, we worship you today. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Wow, don't you love his presence? Don't you love how he meets us? Hallelujah. So, 
Go today in the strength and the grace and the majesty of Jesus. Amen. And he's with you. He commissions you. He walks with you. Now, if you do have need of prophetic ministry, we have a prophetic team that will be here that will minister to you if you need a word. And if you have a need of a, a, a physical healing, we have a team that will pray for you to be healed. So praise God. Have a great evening. Have a great week. Some of you will see for Supernatural School. Some of you will see next week. But be blessed. Have a good week. Go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys.